evening and thank you for joining us for another episode of Business PNG for the year 2015. Customer service is a series of activities designed to enhance the level of customer satisfaction. That is, the feeling that a product or service has met the customer expectation. A smile, a gentle introduction, and kind instruction goes a long way in any business that deals with external clients and or customers. For years, there have been some quite negative connotations for customer services here in PNG. As the first line of contact between the customers and the business, it is a vital component to any business. In this next segment, we take a look at the customer service here in Papua New Guinea. Are PNG satisfied with the customer care in the country? Business PNG reporter Adelaide Curry with more. No business can survive without customers. Customer care service is one of the most key factors in a healthy growing business. To ensure that they have regular happy customers, small businesses to large businesses make sure they keep the customers happy and keep them coming back with special deals and discounts. Whether you are a small, medium, or large business, happy customers mean a booming business. Studies have shown that bad customer care service has been one of the main contributing factors while people to make more loss in a year just because businesses don't have regular customers. City Pharmacy Limited Group, one of the biggest groups of companies here in Papua New Guinea, say that customer care service is one of the most important aspects of their business and that service with a smile will always bring in the customers. All over the world, and you know, it doesn't fundamentally change. We need to look after our customers. The better our staff are at doing that, the happier our customers are. The happier our customers are, the happier our staff are. So I think it is, you know, the smile always goes a long way. And it's particularly true here. Business PNG asks customers at Stop and Shop about the customer care service they receive. Yeah, I'm all right. Uh, the service here is okay. And uh, uh, people here are friendly, being helpful also. Especially with the baby, they're very helpful. Yes, <laughs> especially with the uh, baby products that we've been looking for here. They've been helpful okay. in guiding us. It's, it's a big shop. All right. so, They've been kind enough to help us out. I think the customer care service here at Stop, Stop and Shop is very good in that um, you get to serve um, quickly when you come in to do your shopping, uh, especially on during the day. But if it's at fortnight um, in the evening, it gets very crowdy and it's always busy. But you know, the customer service here, the staff here at Stop and Shop always want to serve you as quickly as they can. While the head of each company may be reinforcing customer care service as a priority, unfortunately for some business houses, the training doesn't sometimes help in customer care service on the ground. From movie receptionists in the afternoon, to the long lunches taken from 12 to 3 p.m., to the ignorant shop staff who won't take notice of you searching for an item, in some situations it has even led to fist exchange as seen in the video that went viral here in Papua New Guinea. The video shows a customer asking for assistance and not getting the right response. The exchange of one curse word, the receptionist flies out ready for a fist fight. Also, the unfortunate thing about this video, we see the true reaction of security guard services here in PNG. A security guard's main priority is to protect the company they are hired under and the customers that shop there. With such situations very common here in PNG. Fortunately, here in Pumbuti, the major shopping mall is trying to make customer care a priority. Rimbunan Hijau, well known as RH Hypermart, Operation Manager Yep Sang Bok, said that winning back a customer leads to more profit. It's very important. As what I would say, once we open our door for business, we got to begin with customer. Because customer is the one that makes things happen. We would not have any business without the customer. So therefore, we have to treat customer very important. 
They are our main source. You know? So we go to, go to any extent to serve the customer politely or whatever we can assist one way or another. As for the staff training, we have orientation with our checkout. Our checkout is our heart of the operation, where mostly we deal our customer. They will, they will end up at the checkout. So the greeting is very important. The politeness is very important. We go to all out to extend our service to make them welcome. No, no matter whether this customer buy a big amount or a small amount, but it is a customer, you know, that, that is there. So we got to work in a way that we got to make them welcome at the best as we can. He holds meetings every morning to remind staffs how important customer care service is. A good customer care service brings back customers. But the real question is, how can PNG customer care service improve? How can a company ensure that the customers are receiving the best customer care service? Business PNG decided to take these questions to the public. They help really well. So, um, yeah, yeah, from my point of view, they're really good. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been here all the time and the, yeah, I've seen that they're really good. So very good, uh, very efficient. Uh, we need uh, a lot of this kind of service uh, in the country, uh, in all other uh, mechanisms. shops. So inside Lord Swab, Swab Lord Senas, uh, the security is always there, and uh, rouse him back now, put him low side. We, we plan to feel him good. Some of the time we plan to go inside the window shopping, we, we plan to get money. Some of the time also we want to buy something and go. So. I'm not losing. I'm not trusting my security too. We go to bank, we plan to misplace or for some kind of thing. We plan to exit. Sometimes me miss a runway. Go time all time. I'm not putting back and me not like putting back. So me me not say go inside the disaster. Me say walk up and me go. There, it's not like effective when, like, us we go into shops and we see like we standing lines or queues or in banks to um to wait for someone to serve us um if. The one serving us, if he sees um, one of his um, one talk or we one of his loved one, um, he will um, um, he will serve him first. And it's just the same as in health service. If you want service, and I don't think um, customer service is going to um, be improved if um, we change our mentality and the way we think. Um, I would like to see a lot of improvement, particularly in the customer care, with especially those who are working in the shops. And I'd like to contribute to, the, to improving customer care, uh, basically improve the content in the hospitality training, and that way then it can improve our customer care service. Coming up on the show, the Kumu Game Changers competition reveals its 40 finalists. Ever since the commencement of the Kumu Game Changers competition late last year, the business world has been abuzz with hopes on what this competition could mean for upcoming or already established entrepreneurs in the country. Well now the entrants have been narrowed down and are currently being refined through a series of workshops coordinated by global experts. Tackling some of Papua New Guinea's most pressing challenges through impact enterprises in the private sector has been the main target of the Kumu Game Changers competition. The competition is a first in the country as well as within the Pacific region and has generated a lot of excitement and anticipation in the business world. 
Some of the country's brightest and best innovators and entrepreneurs have entered the competition in the hopes of showcasing their ideas and talents. However, similar to any other competition, this number has been narrowed down to a mere 40 who will go through the next stage of the competition, the refinement process. As promised when he spoke to Business PNG recently, founder of the Kumu Foundation and initiator of the competition, Anthony Smare, mentioned that the refinement process will involve global leaders in business from diverse sectors. So the Silicon Valley guy we're bringing out, his name is Henrik Scheel. Mm -hmm. And Henrik is a very famous uh, startup trainer. Mm -hmm. He's an entrepreneur. Yep. Uh, his wife, uh, he and his wife are, are recognized as one of the you know, power couples in Silicon Valley because she's regarded as one of the top 30 under 30 uh, in Silicon Valley. Yep. Um, and so he's going to come and do specific training about how to look at a problem, how to come up with an idea, how to develop the prototype. Mm how to then uh, you know, test it on the market, how to scale it, how to implement it, how to market it, how to raise finance. And this is general, not just ICT related? This is everything, okay. so any idea. So he's done it in 35 countries. Yep. He's, he's trained you know, companies like Lego and NASA and okay. those things. So yeah. he's gonna come and he's gonna do it for our 40, which is oh, first time it's been done in the Pacific. He's yeah. amazing. True to his word, day one of the boot camps saw founder and CEO of the San Francisco-based startup experience, Henrik Shield, a proven serial entrepreneur, speak to the participants. My name is Henrik Shield. I was born and raised in Denmark, but moved to Silicon Valley in 2010. I uh, have been involved with uh, several different tech startups, but now focus most of my time on inspiring and training uh, the next generation of entrepreneurs around the world. Uh, so I'm honored to be here in uh, Papua New Guinea to work with the local entrepreneurs and social innovators on help them uh, to help them uh, kind of accelerate their ideas into uh, flourishing. Okay. When speaking to the participants, Shield stated that entrepreneurship is a state of mind. It's a way of approaching life and being proactive by creating one's own opportunities and challenging the status quo. So I've had the pleasure of working with entrepreneurs and, and young innovators in uh, 17 countries on five continents over the past four years. And it's been an amazing experience seeing how much um, you know, entrepreneurs can really change their local community. So I'm a, a great uh, believer in, in entrepreneurship as a um, kind of path to, to positive social change. I think it's a way that you and, as an individual can, mm -hmm. can decide proactively what kind of future you want for yourself, yeah. but also how you can impact your local community. Entrepreneurship is about not just accepting the way things are, yeah. but actually taking you know, your destiny in your own hands and, and try to, to make a positive impact. Business PNG spoke to some of the vibrant competitors who spoke with passion and conviction about their ideas. The reason I'm here is just to push this idea that I have, uh, basically just to um, kind of push for mobile commerce in Papua New Guinea as a way to kind of improve business efficiency just because I think that the commercial infrastructure right now in Papua New Guinea is it's a, it's a bit too siloed and fra fragmented so um, I think that the, the best way forward right now is just to kind of bypass traditional infrastructure like relying on roads etc and um, just kind of leveraging the power and ubiquity of um, mobiles, mobile commerce so yeah, um, yeah so decided just to come here and suss out if I had a chance or not. Okay we are CC or oh. Kalsa Consulate. I'm Kevin and my wife is Sophia. The business idea that we have is uh, sort of a, a diplomatic mission. Right? A diplomatic mission to stage a mini museum and also to have a creative outlet having a creative backdrops. And our target market is usually the hotels or embassies and even the, the airports, right here. Yeah. Okay, um, Culture Consulate is all about um, promoting, um, preserving and protecting the culture of Papua New Guinea which is quickly dying in the sense that younger generations are coming up and not understanding their origins um, because we believe that the origins, once you know your history, your culture from your ethnic groups, it gives you that sense of identity. Um, so that's what we're trying to encompass in this culture consulate, to bring together all the traditional dresses from the different ethnic groups in Papua New Guinea, have them in one location, and have visitors from within the country, we, visitors from outside the country, um, come into this place to experience a sense of culture, uh, specifically in dresses. Um, so our, our, the bigger picture is to have um, a photo studio, also to engage um, 
our fine artists, the local artists, sing-sing groups, um, people like that in the rural and remote areas. So we also bring the talent out and in the long run educate the younger generation. So this culture consulate came about from a personal need yeah, for our children. So um, we would like to you know, bring that out to the public as well. My name is Roberta. I'm 25 years old and I'm from the autonomous region of Bougainville. I'm very passionate about change and helping women and basically my idea is about um, creating a healthcare service finance for saving women from you know dying from cervical cancer or the prevention of getting there so they can be treated with HPV vaccinations which is the human papilloma virus vaccination and we can be able to eliminate the high um, death rates per year because 3,000 women die from it every year so basically I just built the idea by or came up with the idea by using mobile credit lending using technology to make the service of affordable for women even in rural areas and they don't have to be employed you know to get the loan but they can still be able to be funded and receive the health care still to come the plight of goroka's billu mamas welcome back Anyone who has been to Goroka in the Eastern Highlands province have most probably witnessed Goroka's billum mamas selling their billums in the heart of town. The eye-catching colors and designs are hard to miss, and so are the women who faithfully sit selling their billums day in and day out. The Business PNG team had the privilege to visit Goroka for an exclusive interview with the hard-working and often forgotten billum mamas. The plight of Goroka's billum mamas is very real when visiting Goroka town. With their colorful designs and unique talent and full display in the heart of town, one often forgets the man hours it takes to weave the billums and distance they have to travel, many as far as the southern highlands and Chimbu, all in the goal of selling their craftsmanships at the makeshift billum market adjacent to the Bird of Paradise Hotel and in front of Goroka's government administration building, braving the sun, rain and the often chilly weather of Col Place Goroka. When the business PNG team showed up with our cameras and tripods, many questioned our motives and were skeptical about our purpose of filming, claiming that many camera crews and old Big Pla line come over and film what they want and disappear, making profit off of their films and TV shows, but give nothing in return oft times making the Billu mamas feel like they are being taken advantage of. However, when we told them that we were there to tell their story free of charge, they quickly opened up, telling us that they had plenty of stories to tell about their work and what they consider the Billum factory, Garoka. I'm factory Billum, so I'm making kind kind design. I'm making a lot of good I'm making. So price plan, I'm making a lot hundred. Many, if not all of these women, operate informally and are not recognized by the government or big business, therefore are not protected by laws that govern their trade. On average, most women sell about four to three billums a day, making roughly more than 400 kina on a good day. This number triples when tourists flock into the township on special occasions, such as the Goroka Show, an annual event that attracts hundreds of tourists, both locally and internationally. This demonstrates the economic viability of the skill and the Bilum product. Look, look, blow me long. When it's something where all mama is walking Bilum now, Bilum emoli, all work of him all, or kind, kind style now, all work walking plenty now. Now we go to the pine old market, long all like Sarim, long street, all touristy come all like Sarim. But me uh, must make him this like come a one pla, one pla. Something whereby all Mary he can use him long Sarim, long all Arab country na all can make him some money out long this. Though it is nearly impossible to carve a profitable business from their skills, that doesn't mean they haven't tried. One of the more successful billow makers has commercialized her skills and has showcased her designs to overseas markets. 
Florence Stelka E. Kamel, also known as Bilum Mary, designs dresses and other forms of modern clothing, all by using the art of Bilum weaving. Her work includes weaving dresses, trousers, ponchos and accessories, such as scarves and ties, all using Bilum weaving. Her more popular items are made with natural fiber. Florence's work has made it as far as the runways of London and New York, showcasing the Bilum amongst more established fashion designers, a tremendous fit in itself. From where I'm working with, with Bilum, I'm into the fashion part of it, and also, well, with the fashion, I've taken Bilum as far as New York for the, um, it was on, out on the runway, and, you know, I was really excited seeing my Bilum out on, uh, on the runway in New York, and I actually went to under International Trade Center. Florence claims she hasn't had much help from the government, besides a few grants here and there and sponsored trips abroad. She has become this successful through her own sheer determination and with the support of her family. Being a single mom, going into business and uh, turning around and seeing my brothers and uh, at my back is amazing. Despite the challenges and the lack of sustainable support from the government, the Bilo Mamas persevere and the art of Bilo making continues. Seen as a skill reserved solely for women, many men have taken up the skill. Men such as Florence's brother, Moses Kamel, who has always been an avid supporter of Florence's campaign. It so happened that uh, I was interested in uh, sewing. Now, I uh, actually bought two shirts for 30 kina each. They were my favorite shirts. And then after some years, they tend to wear out. And I was looking for that. And then I got into, well, something at the back of my mind uh, told me that, you know, you cannot find it here. You cannot find those shirts in Ley, Medellin, Mosby. Why not do it yourself? So that was uh, the start of everything. I started, well, sewing. And I started sewing a number of shirts and then people got interested and they came and I sold them shirts. And Moses and Florence teamed up in 2006 to design Team PNG's outfit for the opening ceremony of the Commonwealth Games in Melbourne. It happened that it was I think 2006, she was uh, assigned to do neckties for all the athletes going down to the Commonwealth Games. So uh, she came up with I think 40. 54 ties and she wanted me to sew those ones. So I uh, sewed all the ties, neckties, yeah. and uh, the, the athletes wore those ones when they went down to Australia for the Commonwealth Games. Recently, through Florence's persistent campaigning, international organizations such as the International Trade Center, a subsidiary organization of the World Trade Organization and the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, has taken notice of the art of bilum weaving, recognizing the skill as a highly tradable skill which can be used to economically empower women. And ITC, International Trade Center, has rescued us. And we have a big, big job to do now. And uh, I believe that there's something better out there. Because I've come from like 12, 13 years, I've been looking for market. Mm -hmm. I've been called a Bill and Mary. And I think, I'm believing that I've achieved most of my goal now. And mostly with uh, having the support from ITC coming in, is a bigger achievement. Though not as lucrative as other sectors in the country, Bilum weaving is finally attracting international recognition and appreciation, and the market is opening up for the women, which is undoubtedly a positive step for the Bilum mamas. Only time will tell what the future holds for these women and their trade, but they are hopeful. And that's all we have for you tonight. For more business news, if you would simply like to view this episode again, visit MTV online at www.mtv.com.pg or to join the conversation, like our page on Facebook for daily business news or follow us on Twitter at BusinessPNG using the hashtag BusinessPNG. Until next week, have a pleasant evening. I'm Leanne Girari and this is BusinessPNG.